Hi, everyone. Um, if Del Barton and then the judges would like to put your emails in the chat, uh, we can start a chain. And for Judge Park, uh, would you like me to use the one in your paradigm? Um, sure, that's fine. Okay, awesome. All right, the chain should be sent. Are we ready to start? Yep, Del Barton is good. We're good to start. Yep, gun is cool if you guys are. I'm ready as well. Yeah, me too. Okay, cool. So I'm Alexander, we're Khan speaking first. And since everyone's ready, I'll open my timer and everything and we'll be good to start and I'll be good to read. Is it good, right? Okay. 
Okay, I'm starting now. We negate our sole contention is conditionality. Despite our initial rel relaxation of austerity measures at the beginning of COVID-19, the IMF is still embracing its old ways. Ambrose 20 explains that virtually every country's IMF emergency loans contain commitments to newer renewed fiscal conditions as soon as COVID is over, with little time to fully recover before these conditions start. These conditions kill the growth of the, of the developing nation in three ways. Subpoint A is privatization. Many conditions center around priv priv the privatization of economies in developing countries. Specifically, Citizen 01 explains that the IMF believes privatization is necessary because countries are too poor to provide subsidies for water services. Thus, Halifax 09 finds that the IMF frequently makes institutional structures for water privatization a requirement for their loans. Unfortunately, instead of expanding access, water is becoming more unaffordable. Unaffor the WFA 04 writes, the IMF makes consumers pay the full price of utility, decreasing access. And that's why Ghana saw a 95% increase in fees when the IMF was involved. Affordable access to water is crucial. With high water fees, families turn to unsafe sources, which Citizen 01 concludes kills more than 5 million people each year. Subpoint B is health. Oxfam 20 finds that 84% of these loans have conditions that will make social spending cuts, especially in healthcare. Robinson 15 explains that the IMF often requires such health cuts before major health crises. During the Ebola outbreak, IMF conditions forced African countries to limit health services and the number of health workers they could hire, thus destroying their health system. Had these conditions not forced this, the Ebola outbreak could have been quickly contained and thousands of lives could have been saved. Overall, SHOT-13 quantifies in Africa because of these healthcare cut conditions. Spending on healthcare has declined by 50%. These cuts are devastating. A shock includes in Latin America and Africa, these cuts have resulted in 500,000 children dying each year and 5 million adults dying overall. And globally, Stuckler-09 quantifies it's caused 4 million preventable deaths. But it's even worse because deprioritizing health could be devastating for responding to pandemics. YAM16 finds that unless countries respond fast to the spread of disease, future pandemic outbreaks could prove unstoppable and because of greater global connectivity trigger extinction. But even if it doesn't reach extinction level, Samuel19 finds the next pandemic could still kill 80 million people. Subpoint C is resource extraction. Row 16 finds that one of the 72 most ex that of the 72 most export dependent countries, 88% of them became more dependent on exports. The IMF conditions are to blame for two reasons. First, the Gloth Global Exchange in 2011 finds SAP has also ensured debt repayment by requiring countries to devalue national currencies, making exports cheaper. Fair 10 quantifies that these programs devalue the exchange rates of currencies by 31 percentage points. Currency devaluation is devastating as it incentivizes deeper resource extraction. In the case of Sierra Leone, Yemen 20 reports that the currency devaluation lowered the cost of minerals for other countries and decreased the amount of revenue the government made from exporting these minerals. Second, Stiglitz 17 explains that these conditions in the loans include the IMF's push for premature market liberalization. Aredo 11 furthers that the liberalization of ma major manufacturing sectors results in cheap imports and reduced demand, demand for domestic goods, harming the demand for labor. This rapid liberalization has been devastating as Rodin 11 quantifies in Africa alone it has amounted to $270 billion in income losses. If the IMF had left these countries alone, Alashki 20 indicates that these countries were on the path to properly liberalize their economies and create long-term growth. Instead, Rodin continues that rapid liberalization has now trapped these countries in low levels of development. The impact is twofold. First is poverty. Roaster 19 quantifies that the stagnation of the world's poorest will create a new global income divide where the economies of the poorest nations aren't growing. 500 million people will remain stuck in extreme poverty. And instead of wasting capital on the conditional debt payments, ISMI 04 finds that in Africa, the lives of 21 million people could have been saved and 90 million women could have been educated. Second is conflict. Downey 10 finds that protesters might be aggravated by the loss of livelihood they and their community experience because of resource extraction. As a result, the IMF explains to the governments that they have no choice but to use violence to protect resource extraction activities since they need to meet their debt obligations. Bannon 03 explains that this struggle over resource extraction has caused has caused 50 civil wars in the past, which are deadly since he concludes half a billion people live in countries that are high risk for civil war. And Ray 17 contextualizes that empirically civil conflicts have seen the death of 35 million people and outbreaks of disease and malnutrition have killed over 140 million more, 140 million people. Thus we negate. Awesome. Before I start, Catherine, do you need to see any evidence? Yeah. Um, can I see? on uh oh yeah the poverty can i see the 20 million and the 500 million impact sure and then really quickly can i see imf tells governments to be violent yeah yeah can i also see like is there only one violence card or is there like violence over resources I'm pretty sure it's in the same card, but we'll send you all the violent stuff that's connected to it. Okay, okay. we just need those three or four.
Get, oh, okay, it's there. So on the on other countries, it's also free lab. So, okay. just got sent over so awesome i'll let you know when i get them and then i'll get started Did you guys get it yet? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, my name is Hepa Joshi. I'm speaking first for Gun, and Gun is on the on the pro. Cool. Everyone good? Awesome. We affirm contention one is unloading the gun. Food insecurity is a crisis as deadly as a gun to the head as the World Food Program finds that every five seconds, a child dies due to food insecurity. Unfortunately, Delay 19 explains that due to the conflicting interests of political leaders, individual countries have no plan to adjust food insecurity for 10 years. Luckily, the IMF has been solving this crisis in two ways. The first is direct aid. According to the New Humanitarian 2020, the IMF is increasing its food security targeted aid, especially to developing countries. Critically, the IMF recognizes urgency, approving plans of immediate aid to Haiti of $38.7 billion, among many other developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dowd-19 finds in a global study spanning 25 years that the IMF specifically targets food and agriculture in 80% of the countries it helps through boosting private farming and supporting agricultural trade. Castell-21 collaborates that such trade measures have decreased food prices. For instance, Oxfam-17 writes that the IMF has been aiding Malawi, which suffers from an extreme food crisis since 2012 and has funded programs that have increased food production, feeding up to 1 million people. The second is reform. Bread 16 reports that the IMF studies tax reforms using a diagnostic tool and streamlines them to ensure that more money is collected from the wealthy and that revenue goes into government social spending. Bread quantifies that the IMF has completed such tax reforms in 120 countries, including El Salvador, where it led to a $160 million increase in social spending. This aid has yielded results, as the New York Times in 2015 finds that 200 million people have been lifted out of starvation in the last 30 years. Contention two is relief. Guttner 20 writes that the IMF is the go-to financial institution for most countries in times of economic crisis, and it is again today. The COVID-19 pandemic has driven countries to turn to the fund for emergency financing and advice on how to stabilize their economies. Due to the economic dangers of the recession, Rowden 20 affirms that IMF bailouts are necessary to prevent the developing world from collapse, and the $1 trillion reserve, such as the one the IMF is mobilized to deploy, is key to stabilizing the global economy. In fact, Reuters 20 reports that just one month after the pandemic began, the IMF began dispersing financial assistance to countries like Kyrgyzstan, Honduras, and Rwanda. So far, the Washington Post in 2020 reports that the IMF has provided more than $100 billion in emergency financing to 85 countries in need through doubling access to their rapid credit facility. Autumn 20 writes that loans through this facility are provided with minimal to zero conditionalities and a 0% interest rate. These loans enable further economic growth, as Bradlow 20 finds that investors interpret the IMF's loans as an expression of stability and support, giving them the confidence to invest in countries' debt themselves. Beyond giving loans, Summers 20 finds that the IMF has forgiven debt service payments for the poorest countries, and Reuters 20 notes that at the IMF's urging, world leaders have suspended debt payments for much of the developing world. 
This trend is empirical. As the UACC 20 quantifies that members have benefited from the IMF's rapid credit line 29 times during crises, including Mozambique to recover from Cyclone Adai and Guinea and Liberia to confront the Ebola outbreak. As a result, the CDC reports that Ebola in these two countries was able to be contained in less than two months. The impact is lives. Shri 20 writes that by forgiving debt and offering loans, the IMF has enabled countries' resources to go to pandemic containment rather than debt servicing. Deb 20 finds that without the containment measures implemented, we would have seen two to 10 times more COVID deaths, meaning globally we've avoided three to 27 million deaths. Thus we affirm. Um, on evidence, first, can I see the Haiti aid evidence they give like 38.7 billion to Haiti? And then can I see the New York Times, 200 million people like are not starving anymore evidence? And then can I see like the IMF is giving like 120 billion with like zero conditionality? On C2, the zero conditionalities? Yeah. Gotcha. All right, I'm sending those over now. So I kind of want to Okay, it should all be sent. Let me know when you get it and we'll start. Okay, we just got it. So let me pull the timer and then I'll be good to ask my first question. Okay, okay. can I have the first question? Yes, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, on your like second contention, like how are they giving this money to these countries? Is it through like SDRs and stuff or what are they doing? No, so so far during COVID, the IMF actually has not allocated any new SDRs. The way they're giving money is just through loans, through the quotas that countries pay into the IMF. They loan these out to countries with a 0% interest rate and no conditionality. Wait, but isn't that what an SER is? No. So an SER is basically the IMF's internal currency. It's this thing. It's basically has five different currencies in it as the US dollar, no, but isn't, the yen, isn't it like the Chinese. Loans? What? Isn't it, isn't it also like 0% loans or whatever back because you don't have to pay the IMF back anymore? Right. Or? But there's a lot of different ways that the IMF loans, right? They, they do some SDRs. They haven't done it during COVID yet, but they do some SDRs usually. They've also have different trusts like the Poverty Growth and Reduction Trust and the Rapid Credit Facility and the Rapid Emergency Line, which is exactly what they're using for COVID, which doesn't have any conditionalities. Can I get a question? Yep. Go ahead. Awesome. So just going off of this idea of countries using violence on their own citizens. Why yeah. would the IMF, who encourages austerity cuts, as you say in your own case, if it really does encourage austerity cuts, why would it encourage these governments to spend more on their military and on violence? That's not what we're saying. We're not saying it's going to spend more on their military and violence. Well, wait, if governments get more violent towards their citizens, that means that military spending increases. That's not because true. Because you have to fund troops in areas to like watch. That doesn't mean more. that doesn't mean military spending goes up. But that's not what our evidence is talking about. Our evidence is talking about since these countries are like trapped in debt because of the IMF, the IMF is telling these countries to basically you have to re, you have to repay this debt, and the only way they can repay the debt is through this like massive amounts of, of like resource extraction because that's that's what they have to do. And if they're if they're like people like disagree with it, then they have to suppress the violence. Now, can I have a question? Yeah, go ahead. 
So on your like first contention on like food, the food crisis, how is it solving the food crisis? Like, what are they doing there? Are they giving, how are they giving money to these areas? How are they giving money? Sure. So similar answer to my last, to your last question. They have this thing called the Poverty Growth and Reduction Trust. They also have this thing called the Emergency Credit Line. Both of these come into work when countries are going through bad, really bad crises. For example, if there's like a natural disaster or if there's a big like famine, which causes a lot of hunger, the IMF loans these countries money through one direct aid, but two, when it gets involved, what our second link tells you is that what it essentially does is it makes sure that taxes are streamlined and social spending increases and they take more from the wealthy instead of the poor. Okay. On healthcare, your 50, 000, you're like 50% spending down is in Africa. If we can prove that globally spending has not gone down, does that mean we get access to that contention? No, because this is like basically in the past, this has happened where 4 million people have died and 500,000 people have died every year in Latin America and Africa. Wait, I understand that, but I'm talking about specifically about the linked level where you say that spending has gone down 50% in Africa. Yeah. If, if the link can turn globally, do we get access to that link? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, but I think it's done across. Yeah, I think it's time across. Okay. So uh, we're just be going straight down their case. If you need a, I'm gonna be going like kind of fast, but no, it shouldn't be too fast. If you need a speed truck at the end, you can just let me know. I'll be happy to send one. Is everybody ready? Start on food first. They can see the IMF privatizes food. This is really bad. As Sonkin 20 explains that 43% of IMF loans include agricultural conditions that liberalize the industry by transferring resources away from food production to feed the people and towards the export oriented goods that make nations sub subject to volatile food prices. This is really bad because this is really bad. Malawi is a good example of this scenario as Garut 02 adds that the IMF increased agricultural privatization here, propping up a famine and creating the food crisis that they claim to be solving. Come to Marino 912 and the IMF policies which support taking land away from farmers that left 124 million people in starvation this past year alone. Then specifically on food aid, first you can turn it because Foreman, Foreman gives two reasons why aid reduces long term outcomes. First, two warrants. First, local farmers food food aid food aid bankers local farmers there's causes shortage in food supply in the long term second governments will become complacent they don't prepare for future famines because they assume the u.s will always step in as a result least in 07 finds a one percent increase in aid as a percentage of gdp increases long run gdp by 3.65 percent the implication here is that more people go into poverty with gdp decreases which will put more people into starvation long term then they try to say that the haiti gets 38.7 billion in aid no the evidence is million not billion then on the taxes first you, then you can one big turn according to Leahy 20 of queen's part of the imf involvement most developing countries had a progressive tax system that prioritized attacking the rich unfortunately you find that the imf mandates conditions on lending that replace progressive tax systems through ones, specifically DM08 finds that the IMF required the imposition of a value-added tax or VAT in 90% of loans. DM finds that these VAT taxes are regressive because they increase tax consumption on, because they base tax consumption on income, or because they base tax on consumption rather than income leading to poor preparation for people paying proportionally more than wealthy citizens as they spend most of their income on necessities. During the same time period, well eight indicates that ta income taxation on the richest quintile, developing countries was cut in half. As such, these tax schemes exacerbate in income inequality. Russo, Russo of Victoria University indicates that a 1% increase in VAT taxes in Africa reduces the consumption of the poor by 1.03% and increases Income inequality by 0.5%, which is why like Forster 19 finds that the IMF increases economic inequality by an average of 6.5%. This has two harms. First, Locus of the World Bank finds that 1% increase in economic inequality increases poverty by 5.2%. As the poor become disenfranchised and unable to continue the economy, so overall the IMF increases poverty by an average of 33.8%. Second, income inequality is directly in the conflict. Mark 15 finds that income inequality is the root cause of violence in the Sahel, which Reuters finds that put 24, 24 million people in need of aid and 13 million people going hungry. The settlers in Tarsi were on probability. There's no way that they save 200 million people from food poverty. It's just a random and new times article doesn't even mention the IMF at all. 100% probably that regressive taxes happen with the IMF and you reverse the pre-existing progressive taxes without the IMF. Then not the economy. Their entire argument is about bailouts, a few top shelf response to bailouts. The IMF creates moral hazard as, as Bandle 99 finds the country's investors face greater risk, which I believe will be relieved by the cost of mistakes by the IMF, leading to helpful Brookings quantifying that the moral hazard caused by the IMF has created over 100 banking crises in the last 15 years. And you can turn it because the UIFA explains the IMF fights debt with more debt with the funds blessing the government takes out costly loans or unnecessary projects, increasing debt levels requiring another bailout. This is leading to the IMF in this leads Lee to conclude that the IMF involvement increases the chance of sovereign defaults by 2%. Instead of wasting capital on conditional debt payments, Ismail 4 finds in Africa, the lives of 21 million people could have been saved and 90 million, 90 million women could have been educated. Then you can turn it again because of loan dependency. Here, then 20 finds that the IMF created debt dependency. 32% of countries have been loaning to the IMF for like 30 years. 41% have been loaning from the IMF for 20 years. If thus he finds it's nearly impossible to wean an economy from the IMF debt programs. This is because Chow 18 argues that the IMF protracted, and, protracted insolvency to solve the temporary liquidity problems, finding that its loans prop up unsustainable debt. In many cases, the IMF lending with conditionality enabled insolvent countries to procrastinate over a sustainable 
possible solution to their debt crisis. Thus, Salem 17 corroborates that the loan aid, loans and aid that the IMF offers are to dominate and control LICs. Uh, ISMI 04 quantifies that from 1994 to 2003, Africa's population below the poverty line increased by 75% over 150 million people. Then they read that the IMF increases credit in these countries. You should not vote up credit ratings because they are temporary. They constantly go up or down, which overshadow any benefit from joining the IMF because these ratings are affected by infinite number of variables that they cannot control for, such as geopolitical stability, job growth, growth rates, natural disasters, etc. On their health impact, first cross supply or ambrose evidence, countries will be forced to do more austerity cuts, specifically often finds 80%. This is empirically back in Africa. Conditionality forced them to cut 50% of their health spending. That means you can cross supply our, our, our health argument because the decimated health systems are why the pandemic outbreaks last longer, and why future pandemics could be worse. If it could have been prevented if these cuts did not happen in the first place, this means that we are prerequisite to their argument. This is term lessened to 21 million deaths because of failed debt payments that could have gone to, but for there, and this is also some probability. Second, you also want to refer some probability here, as you've seen that the IMF has been historically bad at helping these countries. For example, in, in the East Asian debt crisis, the IMF was like said that they were going to help countries, but the countries that the IMF did help, such as South Korea, saw a 7% increase in 7% increase in unemployment, whereas countries that the IMF didn't help, like Malaysia, had the fastest growth rate or fastest recovery in all of Asia. Y'all want to speak truck? I can I'll send one in the email chain. Yeah, sorry. My Wi-Fi was just like being really weird, which is why I lost some stuff. Thanks. Yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll just send one right now. Awesome. Can I get some cards too? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Which part? Which part do you want? Uh, yeah. So, um, just checking. I don't know if you misspoke. On our first contention, you said they're always going to be confident the government would become complacent because the U.S. will step in. Yeah, because it was like the like the yeah the U.S. like IMF is going to step in. Wait, sorry. Can what did you say? Yeah, I can send you the speech talk, and then you can see what it says. Okay. Do you want the card that like the people step in and the governments become complacent? Is that what you want, or? No, no, I just wasn't sure if you said the like because they're confident the IMF will step in or because the U.S. will step in. Yeah, I think it says IMF. Okay, just checking because you read U.S. Oh, sorry. That's my bad. Do you want to see that card? Or... Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. And I'll just send the speech doc. And we'll be good. Thank you. Okay, I accept it. I will let you know when I get it and then we'll start prep. Yeah, I'll stay unmuted until I get it. Um, I haven't gotten anything yet. No, hold on. I just got it, Catherine. Maybe it's just taking a while. Um, did you hit, did he reply to everyone? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, Don't worry, just hang in there. It's probably coming. Okay. Online it doesn't come within like the next whatever, you can forward it to me. Because sometimes I don't know why I get your emails better. Petla, do you need to see any cards? Um, no, I'm good. Did you get it? Oh, yes, I got it. Awesome. Okay. Um, All right, we'll start prep when our call connects. Wait, sorry, could you just point me to the U.S. card. I don't know what you're looking for. If you're looking for the government complacency, it's under A2 food aid. Okay. Like, Got you. And then, um, can I see a 
card. Can I see the card that you read on my C2 that says that like sovereign nations 2% and then 90 million women? Sure. Can I also see Mariano, please? And I think that's it. Okay, all of them are sent. They're in what the Mariana thing is in a separate email, but yeah. other than that, it's together. Gotcha. Thanks. Stay in muted until we get it, and then we'll start. You all get it yet? I've not. Oh, just got the first one. I got the first card. Oh, just got the second one. Okay, we should be good. Do you want to mute so we can call Catherine? Um, Okay, we're good. I think it's 55 seconds or so, right? That's what I got too. Okay, I'm gonna stand. Okay, so the order of my speech is pretty much going to be down our case and then their case. I don't usually go too fast, but then sometimes I get excited and then I go a little bit fast. And if at any time I become kind of hard to understand, just let me know and I can like slow down.
Is everyone good? Start on our case. Their response is literally not interactive at all. Privatization empirically lifted 1.5 million people out of poverty because a developing country has more fertile land, so better crops, which is why De Castell, which tells you that food prices empirically go down, which is why access goes up, which is literally why our link chain works. But then their evidence is really bad. It literally says that 124 million people are in hunger, not that the IMF put them in hunger. But then on the VAX taxings, we would say one, VAX taxes are good because they allow government to have higher spending power. Thus, NOR 16 says that a 1% increase in VAX tax increases economic growth by 4% because it increases capital accumulation. Turn their case back over to us. But then then let's go on to their second contention where they talk about like moral hazards. One, we would say that there are 100 banking crises. Evidence is so bad. It literally says in the next line that many authors disagree with it. But then their Korea evidence is also bad. Stacey Young 20 tells you that after Korea, Korea explains a loan, after introducing IMF policy reforms, not only was it able to pay it back, but they also bolstered their economy. The disaster was also Savolos' fault, which is why the Malaysian prime minister confirms this to be true, blaming Savolos for uh, over speculation. But then on debt dependency, we would find that Muslim 14 says that after the long-term IMF support has helped low-income countries sustain their economic growth and boost resistance by building fiscal buffers. Take their example. For example, Korean isn't even on IMF existence anymore. Then their oxygen evidence is so bad. Click into the card where you see the data spent on net. You see spending go up. And their card that's talking about 90 million says that IMF uses SAPs, which is just like overdated. But then let's go on to their case. One, privatization of water is really good. Galani 20 finds that privatization of water decreases child mortality by 8% due to improvements in infrastructure, which is why when this infrastructure is better, Salma 18 finds that the access to water increase because they can decrease the price because the infrastructure is more efficient. And that's why it went up literally 30% on net. And IH finds that overall public water systems are really bad, but then they're reforming throughout the decade, right? King 16 finds that the average number of conditions have dropped by 20%, 25% for IMF loans, and Donner 20 finds that the IMF has forgiven 30 loans to the poorest countries, meaning that there are no conditionalities for the people that need a vote. COVID is a really good example of this happening because now they lend through the rapid credit facility, which literally has zero conditionalities on healthcare. One. Con 19 finds that the public health sector in the developing world is really wasteful and puts really great people at risk, which is why when the IMF imposes conditionalities that cut public health, the health market opens up so that private companies can innovation goes up prices go down which is why health comes out at better and bmc health co cooperates with this but then group of 15 does the weighing for you when he tells you that spending health has below risen faster in low-income countries working with the imf than those that don't have imf involvement in guinea it went up 0.7 percent in liberia by 1.6 percent health outcomes in sub-saharan africa including three ebola hit countries which is their impact about like pandemics has improved significantly over the past decade with mortality rates literally falling 30 percent what that means for the 55 percent card is that since we always have to do fiscal tightening when a country is broke mortality would have been down more than 55% because we're looking at the comparative, but then on mineral extraction. One, we would say that since conditionalities have decreased by 25%, mineral extraction isn't even a problem anymore. But then two, since these countries rely fundamentally on their mines, a lot of developing countries in Africa, like 60% of their GDP is this mine, we would tell you that like IMF wouldn't increase mining at all because they have to do mining anyways. But then SAPs are so outdated. Now you can see that we're heading towards other lines, like COVID is a good example of using RCFs, which is why Inquire 14 finds that after 2014, the IMF has changed and no longer imposes structural adjustment programs as it did two decades ago, but then on liberalization, what we would say that current evaluation, current devaluation is good. That's why Investopedia finds that when countries want to devalue their currency so that they can have a leverage over other countries in terms of trade. And Kabora 15 of the UN finds that liberalizing economies have might have short term adjustment costs that they talk about, but it leads to long term economic growth due to lowering the cost of goods and offering a market for domestic goods, which is really important. Then that's the link chain into our first contention about food. But even if their link chain doesn't work, we can still look at their impacts. One resource extraction is so non unique since countries like Germany and China don't have raw reserves, which means that they're always going to compete this either way. But then Bird 20 says that their studies about income inequality are really biased since the IMF programs are always implemented in recessions. So they're going to have short-term poverty either way. But then their studies don't look at the long-term. And Bird, after looking at the long-term of 50 countries in 25 years, finds that overall IMF involvement reduces income inequality by 18%, raises the income of the bottom 25% of the population, and decreases the poverty gap by 40%. This is really important because you're helping the people that suffer the most, which also delinks the turn that they leave on our case. But this is really important because poverty prereqs the war that they're talking about because violence wouldn't even happen if people were happy, happy in the first place, which means that in their world, violence probability goes up. Frank across. Um, I need to see a couple pieces of evidence. First, number of conditions dropped by, number of conditions dropped by 25%. Then mortality rates fell by 30%. Uh, then if I see the health is better, that's, uh, sorry, that's the first turn that you read in health. I went backwards. Then can I see, um, can I see the bird evidence? Mm -hmm. and countries like want to devalue currency to increase trade in Investopedia. I'll, I'll send the Investopedia, but do you want to send the other three? Yeah, I got you. Or, um,
Oh, could I also see one more? Could I also see um, water access increase in prices drop? Um, in response to see one. Uh, I sent the Investopedia card, Peppa. Do you want to send the other ones while we do cross? Yes, definitely. Um, the first three are sent. I'm just sending your the last one you called for. And if you click on the whole article about the Investopedia, you can see all of the economic trading facts. Ready for cross? We haven't gotten the card yet. Oh, you, okay, I thought we were gonna do cross while she sends the cards, but that's fine. No, we'd like to see them before cross. Yeah, that's fine. We're still just waiting on the water access evidence. That one has been sent as well. Just let me know when you get it. Wait, is the they no longer use SAPs in 2014, the same thing as SAP conditionalities have dropped, or is that a separate piece of evidence? Uh, it's a separate, it's a separate piece of evidence. Okay. That evidence conditionalities isn't just talking about SAPs, it's talking about like all conditionalities. Yeah, okay. Can you Can send me that SAPs? one as well? Yeah, or not? Oh, sure. Wait, which evidence? Sorry, the 25 conditionalities or the like SAP? Piece, like the, the, Actually, the both. You I give. think you already sent 25 conditionalities, but we want both of them. Okay. Wait, what's the other one? 25% conditionalities, and in 2014, they don't have SAP. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'll send that. Okay, that's been sent. So we'll start cross after we get that. Mm -hmm. Did you guys get everything? So just waiting on those last two. I don't know. The email's being like really slow here for some reason. That's fine. I, I get it. Online debate. Yeah. Okay. I got no longer imposes SAPs, but did you send the twenty five percent evidence? I don't see that one. That was like one of the first cards. We oh, okay. okay. I, I see. It. So we're good for cross. Mind if I first question since we spoke first? Yeah. So. All right. Let's start on. Start on. Um, yeah, let's, let's start on your case, right? So you tell me on your C1 that governments or that you're solving like the food crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're solving food crisis, why are 120 million people still like starving? Okay. First of all, that is, that question is really weird. That's like saying like, if you are helping climate change, why does it still get hot in the summer? Like literally it, what we're, our evidence is telling is that we're feeding 1.5 million people in 10 years, or we're gonna lift 200 million people out of, like we've lifted 200 million people out of starvation in 30 years. That doesn't mean that there's no more work to be done. That's why the IMF is still really critical right now. It is helping solving the food crisis every single day. And we're taking it like, there's so many people around the world that are malnourished that the IMF needs to help right now. 
Before you saw 1 billion people in starvation. Now you only see like the number you gave me. Can I get a question? Sure. Okay. On your concept of moral hazards, right? Okay. Who were the people that caused this banking bubble? Uh, no. So I would say moral hazard is entirely separate. That's just an example, right? Moral hazard essentially means because the IMF like forgives loans and everything like that, people have an incentive to just take a lot of loans and be really risky with the loans because they so know that- So who's the people? Developing countries. Because so developing countries are taking IMF loans. No, they're taking out loans from, they're just they're taking out a lot of loans knowing that the IMF is going to come and bail them out. That's a problem because they take up really bad loans, which is, uh, which is really bad because this leads them to like really poor government spending and really misuse of the funds. Can I ask oh, you wait, wait, wait. Okay, so can you give me one example of this like really bad investments that you're talking about? Or like they're taking out loans from a lot of different places besides the IMF? Uh, so I would say, A, it doesn't matter where they get the loan from, they can take it from the IMF. Wait, wait, wait. I'm just saying that you're not contextualizing this at all. Where is this coming from? Like, where are they taking this loan? What is this risky project? Can you elaborate? It's pretty simple. Countries take loans from it. It doesn't matter whoever. They can take it from China. They can take it from the U.S. Okay, they so take they take it from China? No, we're not saying they take it from China. They can take it from anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where they take the loan can from. you just give me one example? Just one example is fine. They take it from the IMF. There you go. Let me ask you a question. The IMF. Okay, cool. So on water privatization, right? Mm -hmm. Which country is your Golani evidence talking about? I think it talks about Ghana, if I'm not mistaken. It talks about Argentina in like the 1980s. Right. So, sure. You know, so where in the evidence does it say that prices went down and access increased? It just said that child mortality went down. Wait, wait, wait. The Golani evidence that we read to you is the warrant, right? The actual thing about pricing, like prices decreasing and access going up is the Salma 8 evidence that I read after that. Gal not Gal Galani is just talking about how privatization of water decreases child mortality because of inf improvements in infrastructure, which decreases death. Um, we meant to call for the Salma evidence, sorry. So, okay, just... well, we can send that after. Can I get a question? Oh, that's cross. Yeah, can you send the Salma evidence then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you. All right, it's sent. Okay, I'll let you know when we get it and then we'll send it. We just got it, so we'll start press.
Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the majority of our prep, if not all of it. Um, so I'm going to be starting on uh, like prereq weighing my case and then their case. Is everybody good with that? Never everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. Civil wars are prerequisite to economic growth. As McLaughlin 12 finds the economic growth rate for states in the civil war is 2.2% lower than states not in the civil war. This is because governments divert resources from the economy to the military and civil wars destroy the country's infrastructure and any economic process, pr progress that the country makes. And adjacent states are also negatively affected by civil wars. And as McLaughlin 12 explains, the flood of refugees in the neighboring states overwhelms their public service infrastructure and spreads infectious diseases. McLaughlin further civil wars also damage the economy of neighboring states because of disrupted trade flows. Now I'm going to go on quickly some frontlining. The evidence they give us concedes our thing saying that prices go up by five times. Therefore, even if there's some like access, like a pipe is nearby, prices still go up so no one can afford this. And that's why we're seeing 4 million die each year. Then on to health, they say like it's wasteful, but, and then they say there's like this 0.7% increase in these two examples out of Africa. Even if that's true, there's a 50% decrease in Africa of healthcare spending, which is killing 4 million people and 500,000 children each year. That's why this is more important. Now onto the most important thing in the round, resource dependency. 88% of countries became more dependent on resources because of, because of the IMF and because of resources. The most important link is that the IMF prematurely, prematurely liberalizes the economies and liberalization destroys the de de domestic markets because it decreases labor and the, uh, Africa has lost $270 billion. And uh, Olaski says they would countries would be able to liberalize properly without the IMF. And Rodin says they are trapped in low development, so they, they're stuck with these IMF loans. And 500 million people are trapped in poverty because of this. And without the IMF, 21 million people would be saved and 90 million, million girls will get education. As well as Downey says governments use violence to protect their resources because governments are conditioned to use their violence to pay back for these IMF debt loans, debt obligations they are stuck in. And that's why civil wars kill over 32 million people and 1 billion people are at a risk of war. And there's been 50 examples linked directly to... Uh, to resource extraction. Then the, the responses here for like the SAPs you don't have to worry about because that's not what we're going on. Then they say like you can de devalue their own currency. They say like you can possibly do this, but these countries like there's no incentive for the countries to devalue their own currency and we're not going for that. Again, it doesn't matter. They say like there's a long-term growth, economic growth overall. There's We don't have a bright line for this. This has been happening over like 50 years. And so far as Africa's lost $270 billion, this doesn't make any sense there. Then another thing they say is like uh, that the IMF wouldn't increase. Our Ambrose evidence postdates all this evidence. And they say that like poverty is a prereq because people are like unhappy in poverty. No, that's not true because war is a prereq because with war, there's it puts more people into poverty. Just increasing people out of poverty doesn't do anything because they're they're angry about the, the, their resources being lost. Now to their case, the most important things are that they concede the food aid terms. Remember, Foreman gives two reasons why aid reduces long-term outcomes. The first one is local, local farmers because food aids bankrupt local farmers. And second is governments become more complacent. They don't prepare for future famines. As a result, Lesson finds that there's a 1% increase in aid as a percentage of GDP growth, long run GDP growth by 3.6%. The implication is that people would go into more poverty with GDP decreases, which would, be, which would push starvation in the long run. And then the next next important thing is that it, um, on our like moral hazard thing, moral hazard is still there. They say like, it doesn't make any sense, but moral hazard is still there because people take on risky loans and the IMF is a bailout for that. And with the IMF, this is, this is compounded with debt with more debt. That's the most important thing there. And then on the last thing, uh, like the on net spending goes up. That's not true because we've seen after 30 years, 31 countries are 31 percent of countries are still trapped in these debt things, and funding has gone down on healthcare by 10 percent, and and uh, uh, privatization has caused fees up by 95 percent. Thus, we negate. All right, cool. Um, we're gonna take prep, but before I do, actually, never mind. You didn't read any new evidence, so I think we're good.
All right, the order is going to be our case and then their case. That's all your prep, right? All right, I just want to confirm that's all your prep, right? 10 seconds left, but sure. we can cut in the middle if you want. No, no you can cut in the middle. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Just so Catherine can take a breather before final focus. All right. So again, our case, their case. Let's start on our first contention about food insecurity. What we tell you is that the IMF funds private farming and trade, which allows them to literally pull people out of poverty because it brings prices down by giving farmers a market to sell to. In, for example, in Malawi, the IMF streamlined their existing system to make sure aid went to 1 million people. But then what they dropped completely is our second link about reform, which tells you that the IMF streamlines taxes to make sure more money is collected from the wealthy and that revenue goes into government social spending. They've done this in 120 countries. That's why 200 million people have been lifted out of starvation. The first First thing they tell you is that it's going to bankrupt local farmers and it's going to make governments complacent. Again, Catherine groups all the responses and tells you that they dropped the Castile evidence that tells you that prices are going down. So regardless of what's happening, more people are still able to access food. But then on our second link, they don't extend like the defense about the VAT tax, but let's go for it anyway. Basically, VAT taxes increase government like spending power. So they increase economic growth by 4%. That literally means that in addition to giving people food, we're also increasing economic growth. This like whole contention is so clean in summary, but even then, Feeding America 15 tells you the lack of nutrition leads to chronic health outcomes that these families literally can't even afford to treat. But then Children 17 tells you that we went on time frame because kids who grow up without food are more likely to have like malnourished children themselves because they don't have like good health, like good like health outcomes, which makes food insecurity a cyclical issue that's just going to keep going on without the IMF. But then on our CTO on COVID relief, we'll like concede that credit fluctuates either way. So like there's no impact on this contention. They could try to go for a moral hazard. One, they couldn't even, even give you one example of moral hazard and like that actually happening in the world and cross. But then second, they say that countries take out loans from the IMF to do developmental like projects that are really expensive. The IMF doesn't give developmental loans. This makes no sense. But then they say debt dependency. We would say that they come back because bird 20 tells you that it decreases poverty and decreases inco income inequality. So it works for them. That's why they're coming back. Let's go to their case. What they really, really miss here is when they completely drop bird 20 that tells you that over 25 years, IMF involvement reduces income inequality by 18% and decreases poverty by 40%. That's why our study should always be the most important thing in this round because their studies only look at the short term. Ours is the longest term and tells you that in the most comprehensive study yet, like the IMF is on net good. Let's go to what they extend on mineral extraction. First, they drop the fact that everything that, are, that they are talking about is just a short-term investment, like an adjustment cost, which is why in the long-term, all these countries have lower income inequality. But then they also drop Catherine's response that when countries devalue currency, that's really, really good for trade because it opens up markets, which actually helps people, which is why they also drop the response that tells you that liberalization leads to like growth, two thirds of which helps low-income countries. But then they miss the prereq that Catherine reads. Catherine tells you that whenever people are in poverty, that exponentially increases the chance of war because people are really, really upset with their government either way. At that point, we would say we prereq their case because if people are upset, if people aren't getting food and are in famine, there are going to be civil wars over resources anyway. At the end of the day, we would say there's always going to be fiscal tightening for these countries. These countries would have to cut like austerity and do these really, really bad things either way. They would have to do resource extraction either way. Since they were going to default on their debt, no one's going to give them money unless they do something for their economy. The IMF is the only way. We're the only side that gives you comparative analysis. Vote F. Ready for cross? Yeah, give me one sec. All right, y'all spoke first, so go ahead and take the first question. In Malawi, what caused the food crisis? In Malawi? So basically, Malawi suffered from a lot of like natural disasters, right? What happened in Malawi was there was this like there was like cyclones nearby and then there were a bunch of refugees pouring in that's part of the reason why there was a food crisis specifically the evidence that you concede from rebuttal is that garut will find that the imf increased agricultural privatization in malawi and uniquely that is what caused the crisis because no people could no longer afford food as food all went to exports and like the prices went up Woo, wait, we don't concede that. We respond to that with the evidence that you dropped, which was read in case, which is the Castell 21 evidence, which says empirically food diet prices have dropped because it helps boost private farming and trade. Then, even then, we would say that what you're talking about, your evidence is from what, 2002? We would say insofar as the IMF right now is helping, we're evaluating the IMF as an institution as it is right now. But can we get a question? 
no, 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 wait. What you're really misunderstanding is that because the IMF made it so much worse in 2002, all the solvency that you get right now is you're just solving back for the problem that you made. You're just you're just filling in the hole that you already dug. You don't well, really get right, but we didn't bug that. it because food it. prices went down, which means that clearly this wasn't the issue with the Malawi no, no, no. crisis. Like no. Hepa tells you, it was a refugee. You know, your evidence is all from like 2012, like it's all a lot more recent. Specifically, our growth O2 evidence indicates that in Malawi in 2002, the IMF privatized the, privatized the food industry, which increased prices back in 2002. So even if prices are decreasing now, all you're doing is putting it back to the place where it was before. You haven't actually created on any net solvency since you were just- I understand what you're saying. Already made. Gotcha. Okay. I understand what you're saying. I think at the end of the day, if you look at it holistically, there's two things that are really, really important. First, countries like Malawi all have food crises, regardless of whether or not the IMS, IMF is involved, because there's so much poverty in these countries because they're developing nations. That's why they can't afford food. That's why food insecurity happens. That's why when the IMF gets involved, you've seen it actually solving that for these things. If your link is privatization, we respond to that. That's like a different link debate. But can we get a question? Your link is privatization. How are you responding to privatization? The right? link into your like Malawi was caused by the the food crisis was caused by the IMF. Yeah. If that's our, if your link is privatization, our link is liberalization. They're different. They're different. You really, you really got up here and read that the IMF privatized farms. Yeah. That's really good. That's literally. Wait, what you wait, wait, no. Our link is trade liberalization. The IMF opened up trade, which gave farmers a, a larger market to sell to, which also brought down price, which also brought down prices because now there's a lot more food like flooding the market. But we spent a lot of time on this. Do you yeah. want to get a question? Go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Did she just, she just disconnected. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm pausing the Grand Cross yeah, timer. Like 30 seconds left, so. Yeah, our call dropped. Sorry, let me call her. I'm so sorry, Hi. it just dropped. You're gone. Oh. I'm back. All right, we got 30 seconds left in Grand Cross, so you can ask your question. Yeah, your question's now. Okay. Okay, so if we talk about your third. No, no she's not. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. Yeah. She'll probably come back in a second. Yeah, we're good. Don't worry. She said she's coming back. That's really awkward. Okay. Um, my Wi-Fi, can you guys hear me or, or see me? We can hear you now. Like you're good. Okay, I don't know what's going on. All right, Catherine, do you want to ask a question since... Yeah, let me ask a question. Okay, let's talk about your whole like civil wars thing, right? You're telling me that people are stuck in IMF loans when your old example of Korea, well, actually, let me just ask you the question. Is Korea still on IMF assistance? Uh, okay, number one, our case is completely separate from Korea. We think Korea's like not, Korea's uh -huh. just an empirical- the example that you read. No, no, on Korea is Korea still on IMF assistance? No, is no, my no. question. Korea is the empirical case. But also, you can see that 41% of countries that take IMF loans are still on IMF loans after 30 years, even if Korea is like a lot of other countries. Well, we don't concede it. We say that they're still on IMF loans because they got an IMF loan. It worked for them, so they didn't go to any of the other banks. They went back to the IMF because it worked for them, which is why Bird 20, which you dropped, tells us that poverty empirically goes down. But that's your response. Really concedes that they're still on IMF loans. You just concede why they're on it. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll take our remaining like five seconds of prep that we have. This. I'm writing stuff down. Cool. All right. We're ready. So is everybody ready? All right. So for a quick off-time roadmap, we are going to be starting on um, our case and then going on to their case. So is everybody ready? Cool. Start now on our sub point B on health with a drop in summary. They specifically what we find is that Shaw finds that the IMF decreased health spending by 50% because of loan conditionality. This is really bad. A sucker finds that this has killed over 4 million people. This is conceded. You can wait here first on severity because people that are dying right now in irreversibility because these people died and they can never be brought back. Then onto resources. All you can evaluate resources, they completely dropped liberalization and like final focus. They give a lot of responses, but they're all really bad. First, Stiglitz finds that IMF caused premature liberalization. As Avito finds that this liberalization destroyed domestic markets, crippling the labor force. This is this is really bad. As Gordon quantifies, this leads to $270 billion in lost GDP for Africa. And Olukushi, Olukushi finds that Africa would have liberalized properly without the IMF, but because of this, Roden finds that they're still right now trapped in low development. This has two implications. Number one, Rose finds that 500 billion people are still trapped in poverty because of the IMF. And second is the fact that Ismi quantifies that the IMF could, that if, if, if the IMF hadn't been there, that Africa 
Africa, Africa's, Africa's growth could have saved 21 million people from dying and we given over 90 million girls education. But second is downing, which I quickly can see is that the fact that the governments use violence to protect the resources because the government conditioned them to because they're now stuck on it because of this liberalization has completely flooded and killed their domestic market. So the only thing they have left to turn to is resource extraction. This is really bad because these, because these, um, because uh, Ray quantifies that these civil wars have killed 32 million people and it's really bad and over a billion people are at risk. They give you a response that liberalization leads to growth in the long term. We would say, A, they give you no real time frame on it. We would see that right now, Africa's already lost $207 billion in GDP. So even if there was growth, they're just making it for the money that they already lost, even though they never quantify when this growth happens or how much growth actually happens, we would say it's really small, if any. But then they say that it's like short term and that the short term is like lower income inequality in the long run. We would say, obviously, this is empirically not true. As we've seen, is even if this is true, Africa could have saved 21 million people from dying. Then on poverty, they say the poverty prerequisites war. No, specifically, the reason why war happens is, is that war is a prerequisite to poverty because war causes more poverty. The reason why war happens in these countries is because governments have to do it in order to protect their loans, you know, in order to protect their resources, nothing to do with poverty. Then onto their case, they can see the foreman. First off, they can see the foreman evidence saying that right now aid is really bad because aid held aid, aid leads aid aid bankrupts local farmers and it makes governments complacent. As a result, one percent increase in rate decreases long run GDP by three point six five percent. This is conceded. They say that they say that it decreases prices, but this is non-responsive to what we're saying because like it's but farmers are going bankrupt. Then on the Malawi example, Malawi is really bad because the IMF caused the because Gerald O'Toole finds that IMF caused the crisis in Malawi in the first place. So even if they're solving for it, they're just creating they're just filling the hole that they they're just filling the hole that they dug. Okay, we'll take our uh, five or 10 seconds that we have. Have those. Okay. But yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stand. Okay, so Um, the order of my speech is pretty much going to be down our contention. So it's going to be extending our contention, and it's going to be to their contention. And then, oh, sorry. Order of my speech is going to be our contention weighing their contention way. Everyone ready? Extend our case. The IMF specifically funds food production and expands trade, all of which brings prices down. As Castile 21 says, the IMF streamlines taxes to ensure that more money is collected from the wealthy and revenue goes down into social spending. They've done this in 20 countries, including El Salvador. That puts 200 million people out of starvation. This outweighs on magnitude the largest impact in today's round. But then on liberalization, we would say that liberalization gives these farmers a better and larger market, which is why we actually already responded to their point about privatization and bankrupt food members, because we tell you that they only have fertile land, which means that they have better crops, which means that they're the ones that this is empirically why they've driven food prices down and why this is good for the developing world. But then extend HEPA's way in which tells you feeding America tells you that lacks of food leads to chronic outcomes and that causes generational hunger. This means that our impact is the largest on time frame and it's going to affect the most people in the long term. But then on their Malawi thing, we would say that the IMF didn't cause the Malawi, they drop El Salvador example. But then let's go on to their contention, right? Let's start on the Gupta card. We would tell you that the Gupta card tells you that health spending goes up higher without the IMF. So the IMF mortality decreases by 30%. HEPA it extended this on our case. They just didn't flow it. But then on BIRD, they make a really critical mistake because BIRD 20 tells you that in 25 minutes, 25 years of IMF involvement, it reduces income inequality by 18% and closes the poverty gap. What this means is one, that their impacts are just temporary because the long-term in income inequality goes down. But then two, they're talking about just Africa. They actually didn't extend this in final focus, but we're talking about the whole country, the whole world as a whole, which means that it's better. But then we would say that we saw back for poverty. We're not stuck in IMF loans for whatsoever. Take their own example, Korea. Now we're not stuck in, now Korean isn't stuck in this debt whatsoever. But then they also dropped the fact that conditionality is decreased by 25%, which means that mineral extraction is going to go down because conditionalities are going down, which means they don't have access to their link chain. But then we can talk about poverty anyways. Liberalization, the time frame is only 25 years. Uh, first of all, we would tell you that countries still devalue their devalue their currencies to implement trade, which is dropped. But then on civil war, we would tell you that like IMF programs are really good because fiscal tightening always has to happen in times of global recession, which means that everything in on their world would be worse, which means that if people are more in poverty, then it's more likely to cause civil wars. Because as we tell you, poverty is going to help cause civil wars, which means that in our world, we're the ones that prevent poverty, uh, prevent civil wars while they don't uh, vote for 200 million lives.
I'm just going to mute myself to, or turn off my camera to avoid getting kicked. Okay, um, the decision's in. Congrats to everyone for getting here. Uh, it was a good round, and ultimately it's a 3-0 for the AF from Gun. Um, I can give my decision first. 
So on the AF case, I think you're winning your first contention. Uh, the reform warrant doesn't have any good explicit responses extended to it. Um, the only two responses that are present in first sign of focus are firstly that the IMF caused the like crisis in Mali in the first place, which I think was new, but I'm not sure that that even matters in the greater context of the IMF improving um, food in the developing world. And then the other thing is that it pushes out local farmers, which decreased GDP by 6%, which is uncontextualized and uh, is probably beat by the empirics about uh, decreases in prices empirically. Uh, I think they get access to the impacts, which are not explicitly extended in second summary, but are well extended in second final focus. Um, it's pretty good weighing on time frame about like generational hunger and health. Um, and then the magnitude stuff is good and present there as well. On the neg case. So obviously I don't really evaluate health that's in final focus because the warrant isn't extended, neither is an impact nor is it weighed. Um, on the resource extraction argument on liberalization, uh, I think it gets pretty confusing here in the end. Um, you, you probably do extend your warrant, but I'm not sure about the responses about like they devalue because it's good for trade, uh, which makes this happen inevitably. And then the other one about it being a short term adjustment that's needed to tighten now um, that will pay off in the future. Um, I mean, these responses aren't necessarily as important as the one that's like they reduce inequality by 18%, uh, because ultimately I think that, that 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 empiric, even though it is not that well warranted, is like pretty decent defense against the poverty reduction argument. Uh, and it's especially good against the civil war stuff because they make the analysis that income inequality uh, is what causes civil wars. Um, I think the civil war analysis and the prereq stuff that the NAG is doing about like wars prereq poverty, which like prereqs more wars, just like makes no sense. Um, I think a smarter argument that makes more sense to go for is just civil conflict short circuits growth uh, in the future that they're going for rather than try and like get in, in into the like weird circle of prereqs that's going on here. But ultimately I think that <clears throat> the NAG probably just does not do sufficient weighing against the magnitude and time frame stuff that the AF does, uh, besides the prereq thing. So if I'm giving you like lots of case offense, which is questionable because of the responses, uh, then I'm still always voting AF because the weighing is better. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, um, I can go next. Um, I'll just keep it short. Um, I just think that um, for Meg's case first, um, I don't really see much fear like impacts on anything like float out like, um, and I like agree with um, the previous judge, like nothing was really weighed, um, but AF definitely does a better job of weighing and that's where I gave most of my voters to. Um, and I think AF did a good job of um, bringing their entire contention throughout the entire debate. And that's like mainly where I gave my votes to AF. Okay, I can go now. Um, um, so on food, I think AF wins food because um, the only two responses are just farmers go bankrupt but like they just say like, okay, still people have more access to food. And then the other response is just IMF caused like the thing in Malawi, um, which is new. <clears throat> and then they have this, um, it's uh, generational because the kids like pass it down because they're malnourished. So it's like a cyclical uh, thing that extends into, into like time. So they have like a big impact. And then I think they have that. So they, I buy that weighing because it's dropped. Um, and then on resource extraction, this is resource extraction and like into conflict was like extended pretty poorly. Like, I don't think you guys probably have um, all of your link chain um, because it was extended pretty poorly. Um, but here I just get, basically I just get this dropped response that um, it's short term in the long term, whatever there's econ growth. Um, and yeah, so I just buy that that response is there and then it just to quickly evaluate the other argument and then AF wins.
Thank you. Good Thank luck, you. Good guys. luck, guys. Thank you, guys. Good luck. That was a really good round. Thank you guys for judging.